Good evening and welcome to the 2023 Luminary Lecture at the Christian Medical College in Velo. I kindly request Dr. Solomon Satish Kumar, our principal, and Dr. Vikram Matthews, our director, to join our esteemed speaker for this evening, Mr. Ramachandra Guha, on stage. The Luminary Lecture Series at CMC Velo began in 2018 as part of the centenary celebrations marking 100 years of medical education at this institution. The objective of this lecture series was to hear from visionaries whose lives and work have profoundly transformed society and served as instruments of change. Our hope is that by listening to them and hearing from them, our vision will be broadened and that their stories might illuminate our lives and, our, and the path that we walk on so that it is ever so brighter. Over the past few years, we have been fortunate to hear from several such remarkable catalysts of transformative change, including Mr. Biswara Wilson, Mr. Romulus Viteka and Mrs. Janaki Lenin, Mr. P. Sainath and Mr. Gopala Krishna Gandhi most recently. And today, as we restart this series after the COVID-19 pandemic, it is our honor and privilege to have with us the doyen of Indian historians, a celebrated social and political commentator, author, environmentalist, and one of the preeminent voices of Indian intelligentsia, Mr. Ramchandra Guha. All rise as we begin with the opening prayer, followed by the college song. Reverend Joseph Devraj, would you lead us in prayer? Before prayer, I'll read a couple of verses from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are their words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Let's pray. God of wisdom and compassion, we thank you that you promise to be with us always. Thank you that your presence is with us even right now. Today, we give you our hearts, our minds, and our lives. Thank you for your enabling grace given to Christian Medical College, Vellur, to serve the sick and suffering communities through the healing ministry for the past more than 100 years. Lord, at this time, we thank you for today's luminary lecture by your servant, Mr. Ramachandra Guha. Lord, thank you for his life and his contribution in the area of history, politics, and environment. Lord, you have used him as your instruments and to contribute, Lord, to these areas. Lord, as we hear from him, Lord, you enlighten all of us, Father. The words of life, Lord, may come into our beings. We pray that you would deepen our commitment, broaden our thinking, and transform our understanding of what we are about to do. For you are our wisdom, and you are our teacher, and you are everything to us. We commit this time into your hand. We pray this prayer in the matchless and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Dr. Solomon Satish Kumar, Professor of Physiology and our principal will deliver the welcome address followed by Dr. Vikram Matthews, Professor of Hematology and our director who will introduce our esteemed speaker for this evening. Respected Mr. Ramchandra Goha, our guest of honor, Director Dr. Vikram Matthews, our esteemed faculty, our dear retired faculty, I can see a lot of you uh, in the audience, students from CMC and other colleges and students from schools in Velo, teachers and principals, I see a few principals of schools here, uh, citizens of Velor. And as I walked in, there was a group of people coming in from Rani Pet. So I think we've got a real good mix of people here and dear friends. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome each one of you for the luminary lecture this evening. By default, the word lecture in a medical college refers definite, definitely to a lecture related to the medical field. And we've heard many of those. Many of those. We've listened to some, we've not listened. But in the year 2018, when we celebrated the centenary of medical education, we made it a point that we listen to experts from other walks of life and be inspired to make a change. Luminary refers to a person who inspires and influences others. And Mr. Ram Guha has been one such person who has influenced and inspired others as an eminent historian and environmentalists of our country. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and making the time to be with us. We look forward to listening to you and be inspired. Once again, I warmly welcome each one of you for this evening's luminary lecture. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really wonderful to be back and have this luminary lecture series started all over again. We did, the, has, did have this in 2018, and uh, it was uh, really something that brought the community together. Post-COVID, we were discussing in administration how do we get the community active and participating in many events, and one of them was to reactivate this series of luminary lectures. We today have the privilege, and we are very grateful to you, sir, for having accepted our invitation to be with us and address us. Uh, so Ramchandra Guha is a historian and a biographer who is currently a distinguished university professor at Kriya University. He has previously taught at Stanford University, the Indian Institute of Science, and the London School of Economics. His books include Pioneering Environmental History, The, Unique, the Unquiet Woods, an award-winning social history of cricket, a corner of a foreign field, and widely acclaimed history, uh, which is one of the, is, uh, India after Gandhi, and he's also author of a two-volume biography of Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi Before India, and Gandhi, The Years That Changed the World, both, uh, each of which was chosen as a book of the year by the New York Times. His most recent book is Rebels Against the Raj. His books and essays have been translated into more than 20 languages. Mr. Guha's awards include the Leopold Hidi History of the American Society of Environmental History, the Howard Milton Prize for the British Society for Sports History, the Sahitya Academy Award, and the Fukuoka Prize for Contribution to Asian Studies. He is the recipient of an honorary doctorate in the humanities from Yale University. Clearly, uh, Mr. Guha is highly distinguished in all aspects that he has been involved with and as an author. But much more than that, he has been a voice and a champion for, uh, for, for the rights and justice in, in this country. Humanities and arts often is very, diff uh, very, very, very distant from medicine, and medical people are often the last people to actually embrace the humanities. Uh, but it's very important that we actually look at this more closely. Increasingly in the world, people are recognizing the importance of the arts and humanities in medical education. In fact, the introduction to the humanities course in Michigan State University says, by integrating arts and humanities throughout the medical education, trainees and physicians can learn to be better observers and, interpre in, and interpreters, build empathy, communication, and teamwork skills, and much more. We are truly uh, privileged today to have Mr. Ramchandra Guha in our midst uh, to deliver this luminary lecture. Over to you, sir. Dr. Solomon and Dr. Vincent for your kind words of introduction. Thank you all for coming here. 
I am going to speak on what I am calling the prehistory of Indian environmentalism. And let me explain the term prehistory in this context. Earlier this year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Chipko movement, the popular peasant movement to protect the forests in the Himalaya, uh, which I'm sure all of you uh, have heard of, and which incidentally uh, was the subject of my own PhD research. And Chipko, uh, in a sense, began the contemporary Indian environmental movement. Uh, it was, you could say, uh, the founding event of what we consider to be the environmental movement in this country. Now, what is striking about Chipko was that it was the work of unlettered peasants, men, women, and children. Uh, and uh, this is in contrast to, for example, the environmental movement in the West, which originated through the work of scientists. You know, I'm speaking to an audience of uh, you know, medical professionals, uh, both uh, active medical professionals and future medical professionals. And it's in America, the origin of the environmental movement is dated to a book published in 1962 by a female biologist called Rachel Carson. And that book was called Silent Spring. And it's a beautiful title. And uh, it refers to the fact that in America in the 1950s, because of chemical contamination of the soil, uh, through the overuse of chemical fertilizers, uh, because of uh, threats to the human body through the injection of uh, toxins, you know, uh, pollution and so on, the robin was not coming. The robin was dying out. So spring was silent. Now, <coughs> uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was the work of a scientist. And other works uh, that catalyzed the wider environmental consciences, consciousness in America in the 1960s and 70s were also written by scientists, usually by biologists or medical professionals, talking about the threats and the hazards to human health posed by air and water pollution and chemical degradation of the soil and the rivers. Uh, and this led to a wider debate on are modern forms of life sustainable? Will industrial society, consumer society, <coughs> devour itself, although it creates wealth and prosperity in the short term? Uh, what will happen in the long term because of the destructive methods of production and consumption uh, that were unleashed by <coughs> modern industrial society in the West? Now, in India, on the other hand, the environmental movement began with this peasant uprising, the Chipko Andolan, which was absolutely nonviolent. And it led to a wider debate on whether uh, India could follow Western models of industrialization, given the fact that we had much higher population densities, given the fact that uh, tropical ecologies are much more fragile than temperate ecologies. Uh, did we have to rethink the way we uh, sought to develop? Of course, we faced a major problem of poverty, illiteracy, ill health. No one would be against uh, removing poverty, illiteracy, and ill health. But the question that Chipko raised was whether the methods followed in the West were feasible in India. Now, Mahatma Gandhi in 1928, almost uh, more than 90 years ago, famously warned that India could not follow the patterns of industrialization of the West because the West had uh, to s sustain its economic development. It had access to re the resources of the whole world through its colonial conquest of Asia, Africa, and the New World. So he said, India does not, unlike America, it does not have new worlds to conquer. It has to live within its own resources, and hence it must be responsible. Now, Chipko led to other such initiatives, which some of you would know of. The Narmada Bachao Andolan, uh, led by the remarkable women's activist uh, Mehra Patkar. Uh, it also led to uh, so there were various protest movements against environmental degradation. And an interesting thing about movements like Chipko was that it constituted what I call an environmentalism of the poor. 
there was a mistaken belief uh, uh, that it's only after a country becomes wealthy that it can begin to be concerned about environmental uh, sustainability, that it's a luxury of the rich. But what Chipko showed was that phenomena like deforestation, soil erosion, uh, were actually affecting poor people because they, they depended on these natural resources for survival, and they now uh, could not because of commercial exploitation. In the case of Chipko, what had happened was that the rich forests of the Himalaya were being felled for paper and plywood companies. You know, the government, the forest department of the government had allocated contracts to industry to fell these forests, which had two consequences. On the one hand, it had a neg negative social justice consequence because the local villagers who depended on these forests for fuel, for fodder, for medicinal plants, uh, for raw material, for baskets, they were deprived of access. So it, had a, uh, it, uh, it was clearly biased in favor of the urban industrial sector against the rural sector. So it was, a, it was a case of economic injustice, but it was also leading to massive environmental degradation because uh, in the Himalaya, if forest felling takes place, you, the slope of the hills is exposed, and there's a torrential monsoon. And uh, of course, this leads to soil erosion and then to floods. And it is no accident that just three years before Chipko, in 1970, there was a massive flood in the Alaknandal River, which devastated large parts of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So Chipko was both a movement advocating social justice and also environmental sustainability. Uh, the Himalaya are the source of um, all the major water systems of northern India. And on uh, the sustainable uh, protection of the Himalaya, the life of the whole country depends. Now, uh, <coughs> so the movement that Chipko began in 50 years ago carried on through the 70s and the 80s. Then in the 90s, you had a kind of backlash against environmentalists, which is actually interesting to briefly comment upon, only briefly comment upon. And this was because in 1991, India changed its economic policies and adopted a, 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 an outward-looking approach of economic liberalization. Now, economic liberalization was important. It was true that government control of the economy had stifled innovation and entrepreneurship. But at the same time, uh, you also needed to protect your environment. And when, shall we say, a new chemical factory came up, or a new a mining project was approved in Orissa or in Jharkhand, under the auspices of economic liberalization, the only questions that were being asked were by the environmentalists, saying, look at this coal mine in Jharkhand. Maybe India needs coal. But if, if mining is unregulated, this will lead to pollution. The water sources will be blocked. The Adivasis will be deprived of the water they need for their cultivation and so on. And there was a kind of a massive backlash against the environmental movement in the 90s and 2000s. And then in the last decade, environmentalism was reborn uh, because of the whole climate change debate. Now, uh, and that's the debate, of course, that is the aspect of environmentalism that the young students in this room are aware of. Uh, uh, you know, by the year 2000, it was clear that there had been a very unhealthy accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, this was leading to global warming. It was leading to very unpredictable weather patterns. You know, uh, uh, the regularity of rainfall that farmers had come to expect was no longer there for them. Uh, there were extreme weather events like cyclones uh, in, uh, in all, at all times of the year, <coughs> which were devastating coastal landscapes and peoples. Uh, the Arctic ice cap was melting. The Himalayan glaciers were melting at an alarming rate. And what the climate change debate uh, revealed to all of us is that this is not a problem for rich countries. It is not a problem for rich countries. We are all in it together. That human beings, if they were to, if they were to continue being reckless and callous in their relations with nature, 
would imperil their own future. That it was at that setting where we are today. Now, so there is Chipko and Narmada in the 70s and 80s. Then there is a hiatus in the 90s and 2000s when uh, environmentalists are treated as the enemy of progress, as the enemy of development. And now you have a re rebirth of environmentalism through the whole climate change movement in which many young people are involved. And fortunately, <coughs> unlike when I was a student, there is at least at the level of pedagogy uh, an awareness that the natural environment has to be respect respected. Human activity, economic development has to be carried out given the constraints that nature sets for us. Now, what I'm going to do in my talk today is to talk not about the history, but the prehistory. To take you well before Chipko, as I said, we think uh, that in India, Chipko really brought environmental concerns into the for, 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 forefront. This was then taken forward by other movements, like the Narmada Bacha Andolan, now it has got a renewed flip through uh, uh, the whole uh, issue of climate change. And it's wonderful to see so many young people involved and motivated by climate change. And in fact, indeed, in some ways, in the vanguard of uh, attempts to uh, wean human civilization off fossil fuel towards a cleaner and a more caring and a greener future. Uh, you know, it's great to be in this campus, for example, with a very rich and luxuriant tree cover. But I'm going to talk about the prehistory. I'm going to take you back to the 19th century, to uh, uh, some absolutely remarkable, far-sighted Indians uh, and people of Western origin living in India, who as far back as the 19th and early 20th centuries anticipated our present environmental crisis. And this is what I, the talk I'm going to give to you, uh, I'm going to deliver before you today, is the outcome of a book project that I'm currently undertaking, in which I foreground nine individuals. Nine individuals who, from the late 19th century onwards, and in different ways, <coughs> wrote and spoke insightfully and with acute prescience about the importance of living uh, uh, in harmony with nature and our natural surroundings. And their work spans an entire century, from the 1870s to the 1970s. These are environmentalists before Chipko. Hence, I've, uh, this is the prehistory of environmentalism, even before Chipko, there were people uh, in this land who were alerting us to what would happen if uh, we did not take into account uh, the limits that nature sets on greed, exploitation, um, and so on and so forth. And as I, my book, which, is, which I'm currently writing, deals with nine such, think nine such thinkers. In my talk today, I will speak only of five of them. I will just... And I will just give you, I mean, there's much more in my book. Even on these five people, I can only give you glimpses of the kinds of things they said, the kinds of arguments they made that resonate with us today, that, you know, that we can see that these are contemporary uh, uh, voices, even though they are talking 100 years ago, when they were neglected and scorned and disregarded. Maybe they can be, you know, uh, people like us who are much more aware of uh, uh, the the manifold forms of environmental degradation that our country faces, forms of environmental degradation that threaten our economic, social, political, and civilizational future. Uh, we can see in these voices, perhaps, not just uh, seek some comfort in them, but also possibly even seek some guidance from them. So I've got to give you glimpses of the thought of five remarkable pioneering environmentalists who worked in India, whom Indians have forgotten. Uh, my first exemplar is famous for many things, 
but not as an environmentalist per se. He is famous as the first Indian, indeed first Asian, to win a Nobel Prize, as the only person to have <coughs> written the national anthems of two countries, as the founder of a great university, as a novelist, a playwright, a poet, who revol revolutionized the use of his language. I refer, of course, to Rabindranath Tagore. And he is remembered for all these things, but it's his environmentalism that I'm going to focus upon today, because his environmentalism is uh, about the most interesting and least appreciated aspects of his writing and his legacy. Now, Tagore's environmentalism, again, as I said, I'm only going to give you glimpses. In the book I'm working on, there'll be much more. You know, I'll have, I, you know, in a book you can make the case much more convincingly because you have 300 pages rather than just half an hour. So this is really, uh, you could say, uh, as in Hindi, they would say, sirf tippani derao. I'm just giving you a few, you know, odd uh, uh, asides and, and, and nothing more. Now, Tagore's environmentalism was at once aesthetic, educational, and political. Let me explain each of these. He was an environmentalist in an aesthetic sense, in an educational sense, and in a political sense. So when it comes to aesthetics, if you read uh, his, his memoirs, and uh, or, or if you read, of course, his memoirs, but if you read his letters from rural Bengal, uh, there's a, which are now available in English. They were written in Bangla. They were written to his niece, Indira Devi. And you see these very beautiful, evocative descriptions of the riverine landscape of rural Bengal, of plants, of birds, of clouds, and of course his poetry, and particularly the place of trees in his poetry. So Tagore was an aesthetic environmentalist. In that his literary work, he, he introduced his readers, he exposed his readers, to the beauty and diversity of nature. He was also an educational environmentalist in that he made the appreciation of nature central to school pedagogy. You know, we now talk of environmental education. That phrase had not been invented when Tagore held classes in Shanti Niketan in the open, where he started an annual tree planting festival, where he uh, organized uh, uh, the landscape of Shanti Niketan so that at every season there were flowering trees and plants so that students could learn and live with nature, alongside nature. So he was an aesthetic environmentalist, and he was an educational environmentalist, and finally, and this is, I think, uh, 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 perhaps the most striking aspect and uh, of Tagore, because we don't see Tagore as a political thinker. He was also a political th environmentalist, in that Tagore recognized that imperialism, Western imperialism, uh, of which the British Raj in India was one manifestation, Western imperialism was not merely a system of economic exploitation, but also of ecological control and devastation. And I'm going to, as an illustration of how Tagore recognized that Western imperialism was made possible by its economic, political, and ecological exploitation of the rest of the world, I'm going to read you a long quote from his book, Nationalism. Nationalism was a little book based on lectures that Tagore gave uh, during the First World War. Uh, it, it's a book that should be read for many reasons. It was issued as a Penguin classic some years ago with a long introduction by me. Uh, but here is just one passage which is about imperialism and its ecologically devastating impact. I quote, here is, these are Tagore's words which I'm quoting to you. The political civilization <coughs> which has sprung up from the soil of Europe and is overrunning the whole world is like some prolific weed. This is 1917. It is based on exclusiveness. It is carnivorous and cannibalistic in its tendencies. It feeds upon the resources of other people and tries to swallow their whole future. Before this political civilization came to its power and opened its hungry jaws 
wide enough to gulp down great continents of the earth, we had wars, pillages, changes of monarchy and consequent miseries, but never such a sight of fearful and hopeless voracity, such wholesale feeding of nation upon nation, such huge machines for turning great portions of the earth into mincemeat, never such terrible jealousies with all their ugly teeth and claws ready for tearing into each other's vials. So this is Tagore in 1917. He's not writing about the Russia, Russian-Ukraine war of today, but he's writing about 100, 100, uh, 10 years, about the world 110 years ago. So that is some glimpses of Tagore as a pioneering environmentalist. My second exemplar uh, is the only woman among the five I've chosen to speak to you uh, about today. She's also reasonably well-known, not as well-known as Tagore, but again, for reasons other than her contributions to environmental thinking. This person uh, was the daughter of a British admiral. Uh, she carried the name Madeleine Slade. Uh, she was born in 1892. Until in 1926, she met Gandhi and became his disciple. And Gandhi gave her the name Mira. And she became uh, Gandhi's adopted daughter. Uh, and uh, she figures in Attenborough's film uh, on Gandhi. Uh, she is well known as an uh, aristocratic English woman who became a freedom fighter uh, for Indian rights. Uh, not only does she figure in At Attenborough's film, I'm told there's even a Amal Chitra Katha comic about her. Now, so that side of her work is uh, reasonably well known. She's known for having crossed racial and religious boundaries, for being an English woman who identified with the Indian freedom struggle for her association with Gandhi. But she was also a pioneering environmentalist. And much of her environmental work was done after Gandhi died. So Mira joined Gandhi in the year 1926, uh, you know, was part of his entourage, uh, went to jail in the 30s and 40s. In between, Gandhi sent her to England and America to lobby um, uh, 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 the English and the American public uh, about the justice of uh, you know, the Indian independence movement and so on. Now, Gandhi's last term, jail term, was spent in the Aga Khan Palace in Pune, uh, and uh, which was, uh, and uh, Meera was with him. I mean, so was Kasturba who died, uh, but Meera was with him. And after they came out of jail, Meera decided that she wanted to leave Gandhi's ashram and set up an ashram of her own. So in 1946, she moved to the Himalayan foothills, not far from Rishikesh. And she spent the next decade working in the Himalaya, in three or four different ashrams, <coughs> one near Rishikesh, one in the Bilangna Valley, you know, uh, in the interior, <coughs> and, and so on. Also, she spent a year in Kashmir. And in this decade in the Himalaya, she really was looking at uh, reviving agriculture on a sustainable pattern. So she was a uh, warning against chemical fertilizer. She was a great proponent of organic farming. Uh, she you know, used uh, organic manure. She, uh, she uh, used the methods of a British scientist called Albert Howard, who had actually worked in Indore in India, uh, to uh, decompose human and animal waste uh, into what was really uh, uh, you know, gold for the soil, so that we would not have uh, the, uh, the damaging impacts of chemical fertilizer and would use much less water. She also were, talked about uh, the importance of forests and particularly multi-species diverse forests. Now, I talked about the Chipko movement, and Mira was working not far from where the Chipko movement broke out two decades after she lived there. And uh, if those of you who have traveled in either Uttarakhand or Himachal, uh, uh, I don't know whether you have noticed this, but the forests of the Himalaya broadly have two kinds of tree species, coniferous species and broadleaf species. The coniferous species are pine, spruce, and fir. They are tall with needles, and they don't have an abundant crown cover. The broadleaf species are usually many varieties of oak, but also beech and horse chestnut. And these have a very uh, 
uh, they're not so tall, but they have a very kind of expansive crown cover, and they have uh, a very rich undergrowth. So under a pine forest, the floor is bare, except for the pine needles that fall. Under an oak forest, you will have many plant species, bamboo, uh, you know, uh, flowering species, and so on. So it's much more biodiverse. Uh, it also protects the soil much better. Now, however, pine is commercially valuable. Oak and uh, the associated shrubs and flowers and other items that are there around an oak forest are valuable to the local economy, which uses it sustainably without destroying the forest. But pine is was very very uh, makes for very good timber for laying across railway tracks, for making plywood, and for making paper. So particularly after independence and the drive to industrialize and develop, the pine forest became very valuable. And the forest department not only awarded contracts to uh, timber companies from the plains to cut these forests, which I've explained, which led to the Chipko movement, they also started manipulating the species composition of the forest to uh, reduce the area under broadleaf species and increase the area under pine because that would bring more money to the government exchequer. And Mirabai, uh, in 1949, warned against this. I won't read out uh, just for uh, for time, for matter of time. She wrote in 1952 a fascinating article called "Something Is Wrong in the Himalaya," which explained in great detail what happens when you replace broadleaf forests with pine, what it does to the ecology, what it does to soil erosion, how it increases the, uh, uh, the possibility of floods, and why it was economically and environmentally disastrous in the long run to reduce the area of broadleaf and increase the area of pine. And of course, she was neglected with consequences we know of. I'm not going to uh, say any more about that, but I'm going to read you what Remarkable quotation from Mirabel from the year 1949. Uh, you know, I read you a quotation from Tagore from 1917, and you would have seen how contemporary it was. The quotation from Mirabel from 1949 is even more contemporary. This is what she wrote in 1949. <clears throat> the tragedy today, the tragedy today is that Educated and moneyed classes are altogether out of touch with the vital fundamentals of existence. They are out of touch with our Mother Earth and the animal and vegetable population which she sustains. It's the wealthy people who are out of touch with the Mother Earth because they, you know, we sit in this auditorium and we don't know where the materials that built this auditorium came from. You know, the wood and the cloth and the power and the energy. We just take it for granted. So she says in 1949, the educated and moneyed classes are out of touch with Mother Earth and the animal and vegetable population which she sustains. This world of nature's planning is ruthlessly plundered, despoiled, and disorganized by man whenever he gets the chance. By his science and machinery, he may get huge returns for a time but ultimately will come desolation. By his science and machinery, he may get huge returns for a time, but ultimately will come desolation. And then she ends the quotation by saying, we have got to study nature's balance and de develop our lives within her laws if we are to survive as a physically healthy and morally decent species. So that was my second exemplar, Mirabel. Now, everyone in this audience would have known the name of Rabindranath Tagore. I suspect a reasonable proportion, at least the older people in this audience, shall we say 30, 40, 30 to 40% of this audience, would have known of Mirabel and Madly Slade. The third name I'm going to offer to you will be absolutely unknown to you, anyone here, but don't feel embarrassed or ashamed because this name would be unknown in any other college in India, too. But he was, like Tagore and Mirabel, a great pioneering environmentalist. His name was Radha Kamal Mukherjee. Uh, 
Dr. Matthew talked about the importance of bringing humanists to uh, uh, a medical college. Uh, what was remarkable about Radha Kumar Mukherjee, it's also, by the way, by the way, since you said that, it's also important to bring scientists and medical professionals to social science and humanities departments. That's equally important, perhaps even more important, because technology can change our lives in dramatic ways, and we humanists have to understand it. Now, what is, Radha Kamal Mukherjee was born in 1887 in Eastern Bengal. Uh, he studied in Kolkata, where he knew Tagore a little bit. He spent the bulk of his life teaching in Lucknow University. And he was a pioneer of interdisciplinary thinking, something that is now quite fashionable. But we are talking about the 1920s. In 1920s, Radha Kamal Mukherjee, who was ostensibly professor of economics in Lucknow University, was talking about, on the one hand, how, what economics could learn from sociology, psychology, and anthropology. And on the other hand, what the social scientists uh, taken together could learn from the natural sciences. And he was a truly uh, pied, true, a true pioneer of interdisciplinary research and of ecological thinking. Again, I wish I had uh, you know, enough time to uh, you know, talk about his work and his legacy at great length. But let me just give you a few quotations of his on this interdisciplinary approach, on this integrative approach. In the 1930s, Mukherjee published several essays in American journals urging that sociologists adopt an ecological approach. The laws of economics and sociology have to subserve the more comprehensive laws of the balance of life, he wrote. Indians, he said, have no option but to some extent imitate nature's extraordinarily slow methods in how uh, the, they live and work. Ecological adjustment, he further wrote, has to be raised to an ethical plane. It's not just important from an economic or social point of view, but from an ethical point of view. Uh, he said, applied human ecology is the only guarantee of a permanent civilization. Applied human ecology is the only guarantee of uh, 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 a permanent human civilization. Now, these ideas that animate Mukherjee's work of the interdependence of humans and the natural world are now commonplace among environmental scientists and activists. But back in the 20s and 30s, they were pioneering. He was advocating an ethic of restraint and responsibility that ran, ran counter to an aggressive, predatory, expansionary society. And he was, so he was a pioneer, both in terms of policy, in advocating restraint and responsibility in how humans uh, treated nature, but he was also an intellectual pioneer in seeing all these disciplines as, you know, in a sense, uh, uh, as uh, ne needing to learn from one another, talking about an integrative approach to knowledge and, of course, to research. So that is Mukherjee. I come very quickly to my fourth early environmentalist. Again, a name you have no reason to know. Uh, 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 and that is why I'm speaking about him to you here today. His name was Patrick Geddes. He was born in 1854. He was, Scots he was Scottish, a Scottish scientist who worked in the cities. Now, Tagore, Mirabain, and Mukherjee, whom I've talked about, largely focused on environmental and social issues in the countryside. The fourth person I'm going to talk to you about, briefly, Patrick Geddes, was an urban planner. He uh, wrote and talked about how to bring the principles of ecology and sustainable living to city dwellers. Uh, he came to India uh, when he was 60. In fact, uh, I'll tell you an interesting story about Patrick Geddes, which, uh, uh, you know, which, is, which, which should cheer all of us up, especially those of us who are in our 60s. Uh, he was a professor in Edinburgh and Dundee in Scotland. He was a famous town planner in Scotland and Europe. And he had developed an exhibition based on his travels and his studies in Europe. It was, it was called Cities in History. So it talked about the rise 
rise uh, and fall and decay of cities against an ecological context. So it was kind of a social and environmental history of European cities, small, large, and uh, medium. How, you know, what was their relationship to the landscape, what they did with pollution, why they sustained themselves, why, when they collapsed. And he had designed this exhibition. And he was bringing this exhibition uh, to India, to show it in India uh, in 1914 at the invitation of a friend in Madras. So he comes to, uh, takes a ship, these are the days before air travel, he takes a ship from Scotland to Madras, and the exhibition is in the next ship. You know, like when we travel by air, our, our luggage is, in the, is you know, it's checked in, it's not with us, except it's in the same, it's in the same plane. In this case, the exhibition was so large, it was coming in a cargo ship. Now, after he, Geddes boarded the ship, the first world war between England and Germany broke out. He arrived safely, but a German submarine sank the cargo ship, and his life's work went down with it. Now, he was 60 years old, but he said, no problem. I'll start my life anew. I have studied European cities for four decades, uh, written books about them, uh, made a wonderful exhibition. The exhibition is now at the bottom of the sea. OK, let me study Indian cities now. So he spent the next decade uh, studying Indian cities at small, large, he wrote about Thade, Ahmedabad, Lahore, Indore, uh, Patiala, Barrampur in UP. He wrote about 24 town plans about Indian cities and what could be done to make them more habitable, uh, to make them more friendly to nature, to make them more egalitarian. And uh, reading those 24 town plans of his, are absolutely fascinating experience. And uh, in my view, uh, they kind of illustrate his philosophy of town planning. And this philosophy rested on three core principles. The, uh, this is my interpretation of Geddes' philosophy of town planning. The first principle was respect for nature. So in his plans, he talks about the planting of trees, the importance of parks, and above all, the renewal of water bodies, like tanks, wells, lakes, rivers. You know, how to make uh, uh, clean and accessible water important, both for sustaining uh, households uh, in what, they, what water they need, but also in an aesthetic sense, you know, places where people could congregate, uh, you know, enjoy, and so on. So that's the first theme, respect for nature. The second theme is respect for democracy. So he paid, he paid a great deal of importance to the rights of women. Now, we are talking about uh, Geddes worked here between 1914 and 1924, when there was a great deal of segregation between men and women. So where men and women could not uh, you know, be together in public. So he talked about parks for women and children. He designed uh, a, a system of drawing water up from a well that would be less burdensome to the woman's body. Uh, so, and also the working class. So he, he knew that, you know, he talked about reviving working class areas and making them, you know, more nature friendly. Then he also talked about participatory planning. He said, if you want to improve a city, every citizen must be involved in, it, in, in the decision making. It's not one mayor or one chief minister or, you know, one big shot who decides. So respect uh, for nature, uh, respect for democracy, and finally, Respect for tradition. You know, he, uh, he, he had come to South India and wrote an essay on our temple cities, including Madurai. And he saw how traditional Indian architecture and craftsmanship was very, very sophisticated and well developed. Whereas contemporary Indian architecture was ugly and dehumanizing. And he said, we have to retain what remains. You know, uh, so you know, if you have an old part in Ahmedabad, he wrote a town plan for Ahmedabad. We talked about restoring the old city with its beautiful wood carving. So respect for nature, respect for democracy, and respect for tradition. Now, uh, and I'll just read you one quotation from Geddes when it comes to uh, respect for tradition. <coughs> Geddes urged the impatiently modernizing Indian town, the impatiently modernizing town planner to pause and consider whether, quote, where domestic architecture is so good and so well adorned 
that it may be well, uh, they may be well advised to conserve it, to meet the modern requirements of the present without losing the constructive traditions of the past. Now, that is something we have completely lost because we obliterate the past where in an architectural sense, and whereas where actually we can you know, keep elements of it that are still worth preserving. Okay, uh, <coughs> I've given you four names and I'm now coming to my last name and then I'll offer, I'll give you some illustrations of his work and then I'll offer a few concluding remarks and uh, end my talk. My last exemplar was from Tamil Nadu. And I have not chosen him because I'm speaking in Tamil Nadu. It so happens that I've been interested in his life and work for a very long time. Uh, he was a campaigning journalist called M. Krishnan, born in 1912, the son of a great Tamil novelist called A. Madhavaya, uh, who did study zoology. Uh, Krishnan himself studied zoology in Madras. And made a living as a freelance journalist, writing a column called Country Notebook that ran for 45 years. It may be the longest running column uh, in an Indian newspaper. Uh, he was a wonderful pro stylist in English and also in Tamil, and he was a fabulous photographer. He was one of, he was one of India's great wildlife photographers. Uh, he was India's greatest naturalist, and he remains much less known uh, then, for example, Salim Ali or Corbett. You know, if you look at Indian naturalists whom people read or know of, they know about Corbett because he's associated with a tiger. They know about Salim Ali because he's associated with birds. But Krishna was actually a greater naturalist than both Corbett and Salim Ali. And among the aspects of his greatness was that he did not deal only with birds or only with tigers, but with all aspects of nature. And he was also a campaigning journalist. You know, he talked about the importance of preserving nature. He believed, and I quote here, the saving of our wildlife is a race against time. He hoped uh, that by means of the measures he, he advocated of conservation, Indians now living can assure to our future generations a joy and a pride in the country's great heritage of nature, one of the most deeply satisfying things that life in India has to offer to the people. Now, what aspect of Christian's nature writing, you know, he was an extraordinary, beautiful stylist, extraordinarily diverse range of interests. Uh, I compiled a collection of his essays called Nature Spokesman, uh, which is still in print, you'll get it in Amazon. Nature Spokesman and Christian <coughs> and Indian Wildlife. Out of the nearly 1,500 newspaper articles he wrote, I chose 60. And, uh, uh, I am not. This is, I am, this is not uh, a manifestation of false modesty when I say compiling that and editing and annotating and curating that collection of Krishna gave me more pleasure than any of the books I have myself written. So anyone here who is interested in nature in any way, please get M. Krishnan's Nature Spokesman. The book is called Nature Spokesman and Krishna in Indian Wildlife. Now, what aspect of Krishnan, and then I'll end what I have to say about Krishnan, was his ecological patriotism. Uh, he detested exotic species. Uh, he once visited the Indian Institute of Science. Now, many of you here would have been to the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. It's a beautiful campus. And I hope you won't be offended if I say it's even more beautiful than your campus. <laughs> and uh, uh, he once visited uh, the campus in, in spring when the tabubuya was in bloom, you know, beautiful yellow flowers and all of that. And uh, after his talk, he gave a talk at the Center for Ecological Sciences that there was a dinner, like I'm giving you a talk today. After that, there was a dinner hosted for him by the director, like there's a dinner hosted for me today by the principal. And I don't, I don't know whether our principal is married or not, but the director of Engineering Science was married. And so it turned out that his wife, had a great interest in plants and horticulture and had actually designed some of the trees in the campus. So she asked Mr. Mr. Krishnan, what do you think of our campus, the Tapu Buya the Bloom? He said, grateful. Approved all the exotic trees and plant indigenous species instead. Right, so he was, he may have, I don't know how many indigenous species you have here, uh, and what is the uh, proportion of indigenous to exotics, but if you want to be a true ecologist, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to correct that. Okay, now, I'll just 
given you very brief glimpses of the writing, the ideas, the arguments of five remarkable pioneering environmentalists. One was a poet, Tagore. A second was a social activist, Meera Ben, the follower of Gandhi. A third was a social scientist, Radha Kamal Mukherjee, professor of economics at Lucknow University. A fourth was a natural scientist, Patrick Geddes, professor of biology and town planning. And the fifth was a journalist, M. Krishnan. I provided you some quotes and some uh, just kind of, as I said, tippanies to give you a flavor of their insight and their passion. Now, I see my work principally as a contribution to intellectual history, to providing a deeper and richer illumination of the past. But it may nonetheless provide some pointers to the present. So Tagore, we can learn from Tagore on how to integrate the environment in the everyday education of our school children. We can learn from Mira on the importance of making agriculture sustainable uh, 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 in an ecological sense. We can learn from Radha Kamal Mukherjee on the importance of interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary approaches to knowledge and scholarship. We can learn from Christian about the importance of the conservation of biodiversity and not just tigers and elephants and mega charismatic uh, animals like that, but every form of life on earth. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, we can learn from Gedis in making Indian cities habitable. Now, as was mentioned, uh, in, the, in the introduction, I am also a biographer of Mahatma Gandhi. And Mahatma Gandhi said and did some remarkable things, but he was human. And he also said and occasionally, also did and occasionally said some very foolish things. And one of his remarks, uh, which falls, falls in the category of, uh, if not foolish, uh, shall we say, superficial and tendentious, was his line, India lives in her villages. Now, India has always lived in her cities too. It's true that when Gandhi spoke those lines, maybe 80%, 85% of India lived in its villages. But India has had an old and sophisticated urban civilization, dating back to Harappa, uh, you know, Indus Valley civilization, you know, uh, our ancient cities like Ahmedabad, Hyderabad, Delhi, etc. And of course, the colonial cities. And today, India lives more and more in our cities. Almost 40% of India lives in our cities. And that's why the major ecological crises are. It's the cities that prey on the resources of the countryside. You know, if you look at Bangalore, and where Bangalore over the last 70, 80 years has got its water from. First, it was from uh, uh, a large tank called the Hesargata Lake. Then it was from a larger reservoir close to Bangalore called the Tipaganda Holy, uh, Tipaganda Holy Reservoir. Now it is from the Kali, which is uh, 60 miles away, it has to be pumped up the hill. And now we are talking about getting water from, the, from Bangalore from the Sharavati, which is in the Western Ghats. So, making urban life habitable, sustainable is absolutely crucial, and that's where, of course, the relevance of Patrick Geddes comes. Uh, what my, uh, this is the last comment I made. I, I mentioned in my prefatory remarks how. The climate change crisis has made even the most skeptical among us aware of the importance of uh, human beings having to live within the boundaries set by nature. Now, however, even if there was no climate change today, India would be an environmental disaster zone. Our rivers are biologically dead. We have the highest rates of air pollution in the world. Uh, our forests are scraggly, uh, depleted, uh, uh, you know, there's so many invasive species, weeds in all our forests. We talk about the chemical contamination of the soil. Uh, so even if there was no climate change, uh, India would be an environmental disaster zone. And what this, uh, my talk today tells you is that there's an environmentalism before climate change, there's an environmentalism beyond climate change. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, for that exceptionally enlightening talk. As a token of our appreciation and gratitude, we would like to honor you with the traditional shawl by our principal, Dr. Solomon. I'll now invite uh, Dr. Vinod Abraham, Professor of Physiology, Professor of Community Medicine, to uh, uh, deliver the vote of thanks and uh, followed by the national anthem. Oh, thank you, Emmanuel. I'm glad you remembered what I taught you. Uh, it's my pleasant duty to say the vote of thanks. I'd first like to say a very big thank you to Mr. Ramachandra Guha for your uh, really nice talk. Uh, it was educative. It was inspiring, it was eloquent, and challenging. Uh, you combined history, geography, ecology, environmentalism, industrialization, nature, politics, a little bit of corruption, and a lot more into a 45-minute package which really held us spellbound. Uh, it showed us your depth of knowledge and your passion. It taught us all as teachers how you can actually do a 45-minute talk with just a few notes of paper without any other technology and still keep us spellbound for the entire duration. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank our director, Dr. Vikram, our principal, Dr. Solomon, for reigniting the luminary lectures. And I'm sure we all agree that it's really uh, useful for us to hear uh, thoughts and ideas which a lot of us are not really exposed to. Uh, I'd like to thank all our local guests uh, teachers, students from other schools in and around Wello for taking the time to come. Several retired faculty are here, several alumni are here. Uh, a lot of our staff are here in spite of their very, very busy schedule. Thank you all for coming. A large number of students have been here. It's probably the largest number of students we've seen at Luminary Lecture. Thank you all for taking time from your busy schedule and coming. Uh, the principal's office staff, the maintenance department, and finally, uh, Dr. Pippa and several members, all the members in the luminary committee uh, who have uh, spent a lot of time to help put this together. Thank you very much. Okay.